Hello, this is Mike Corrali with the Introduction to International Relations course online. Welcome. In today's lecture, we rely on Chapter 5, titled The State and the Tools of Statecraft, in our textbook, Essentials of International Relations, by Karen Minkst. In this chapter, the author introduces us to terms such as bureaucratic politics, credibility, deterrence, diplomacy, globalization, sanctions, statecraft, and the pluralist model. As is usual in our class, I anticipate you're having already read Chapter 5 before starting to tackle this lecture and this essay assignment. I always assume that the listener is familiar with the key terms, the definitions, and the discussion questions as presented in the textbook, and is ready to take the next step of investigation by having those key elements already under their belt. Thus, we proceed. As you know all too well now, we start every lecture and end every lecture with the introduction of our seminar question. The seminar question gives us an opportunity to take all that we learned in the textbook reading, in the lecture, in any supplemental reading, and having given all this deep thought to answer one specific question tooled to elicit the student's ability to communicate their understanding of the course content extemporaneously. In today's lecture, then, our seminar question is, each of the three main international relations perspectives, that is, realism, liberalism, and constructivism, has its own view of the state, as described in Chapter 3 of our textbook, as well as in our recorded lecture on IR theories. I'm asking you, utilizing the comparative approach established in this lecture, please choose two of the four case studies to develop an analysis of paths of political organization and legitimacy in the states you choose using each of the three IR perspectives as a basis of comparison. So one more time, although it's listed on the screen and you can pause this anytime and write it down, utilizing the comparative approach established in this lecture, please choose two of the four case studies presented to develop an analysis of paths of political organization and legitimacy in those states, using each of the three IR perspectives as a basis of comparison. In order for us to get a well-considered understanding of the disparate parts of comparative politics, I turn to an amazing book by Patrick O'Neill called The Essentials of Comparative Politics. In this lecture, I'm going to draw liberally from his text and encourage you to purchase it if you're looking to deepen your understanding of this important topic. So asking then, what is comparative politics to get a base understanding of what it is we're trying to achieve today? First, we must identify what comparative politics is. Well, as we've discussed several times in this class, politics is the struggle in any group for power that will give one or more persons the ability to make decisions for the larger group. This group may range from a small organization to the entire world. Politics occurs wherever there are people and organizations. For example, we can speak of office politics when we're talking about power relationships in a business setting. Political scientists, in particular, concentrate on the struggle for leadership and power in a political community, a political party, an elected office, a city, a region, or a country. It's really hard, therefore, to separate the idea of politics from the idea of power, which is the ability to influence others or impose one's will on them. 
Politics, then, is the competition for public power, and power is the ability to extend one's will. In political science, comparative politics is a subfield that compares this pursuit of power across countries. The method of comparing countries can help us make arguments about cause and effect by drawing evidence from across space and time. For example, one important puzzle we will return to frequently in this lecture is why some countries are democratic while others are not. Why has politics in some countries resulted in power being dispersed more among people, while in other countries politics has been concentrated in the hands of the few? Why is South Korea democratic, while North Korea is autocratic? Looking at North Korea alone won't necessarily help us understand why South Korea went down a different path, or vice versa. Therefore, a comparison of the two, perhaps alongside similar cases in Asia, may better yield explanations. As should be clear from our discussions heretofore, these are not simply academic questions. Democratic countries and pro-democracy organizations actively support the spread of like-minded regimes around the world, and democracy has backslid in many countries over the last few years. If it is unclear how or why democracy emerges, it becomes much harder to promote it or to defend it. It is therefore important to separate ideals from our concepts and methods and not let the former obscure our use of the latter. Comparative politics can inform and even challenge our ideals, providing alternatives and guiding us to question our assumption that there is one right way to organize political life. If comparison, then, is an important way to test our assumptions and shape our ideals, how we compare cases is important. If there is no set of criteria or guide by which we gather information or draw conclusions, our studies become little more than really a collection of details. Researchers thus often seek out puzzles, questions about politics with no obvious answer as a way to guide their research. From there, they rely on some kind of comparative method, a way to compare cases and draw conclusions. By comparing countries or subsets within them, we scholars seek out conclusions and generalizations that could be valid in other cases. Hence are using these four case studies enclosed within this lecture in an attempt to understand international relations writ large by using a comparative method on specific cases. So to return then to my earlier question, let us say that we're interested in why democracy has failed to develop in some countries. We might approach the puzzle of democracy by looking at North Korea. Why has the North Korean government remained communist and highly, and highly repressive, even as similar regimes around the world have collapsed? A convincing answer to this puzzle could tell scholars and policymakers a great deal and even guide our tense relations with North Korea in the future. Examining one country closely may lead us to form hypotheses about why a country operates as it does. We call this approach inductive reasoning, the means by which we go from studying a case to generating a hypothesis which is what our seminar question is intended to allow us to do. But while a study of one country can generate interesting hypotheses, it does not provide enough evidence to test them. Thus, we might study North Korea and conclude that the use of nationalism by those in power has been central to the persistence of non-democratic rule. In so concluding, 
we might then suggest that future studies look at the relationship between nationalism and authoritarianism in other countries. Inductive reasoning can therefore be a foundation upon which we build greater theories in comparative politics and subsequently in understanding international relations. But comparative politics can also rely on what's called deductive reasoning. So inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning diverge. Deductive reasoning, starting with a puzzle and from there generating some hypothesis about cause and effect to test against a number of cases. Whereas inductive reasoning starts with the evidence as a way to uncover a hypothesis, deductive reasoning starts with a hypothesis and then seeks out the evidence. In our example of inductive reasoning, we started with a case study of North Korea and ended with a testable generalization about nationalism, right? Well, using deductive reasoning, we would start with hy our hypothesis about nationalism and then test that hypothesis by looking at a number of countries. By carrying out such studies, we may find a correlation or apparent association between certain factors or variables. If we were particularly ambitious, we might claim to have found cause and effect or a causal relationship. Inductive and deductive reasoning can help us better understand and explain political outcomes and ideally could help us predict them in our study of international relations. Just as we're wont to do with any field of study, a first good step is to scan the literature for an understanding of what questions to ask and what tools are available to us. To that end, international relations, and in this aspect, comparative politics, has some major key thinkers to consider so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel or perhaps to understand the scope of the area in which we're the scope of the area under our examination. I would argue that Aristotle, Machiavelli, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Rousseau, Montesquieu, Karl Marx, and Max Weber would be major thinkers in comparative politics. Now, we're not going to go into far great depth in understanding all these key thinkers. Rather, we're going to touch on their writings and their contribution to the field of comparative politics in order to use their deep thinking to our advantage in developing our seminar questions essay. We know that it was Aristotle who first separated the study of politics from that of philosophy. Aristotle used the comparative method to study the Greek city-states in his work The Politics, where he conceived of an empirical study of politics with a practical purpose, just as we're doing. So we understand that Aristotle who was born in 384 BCE and died in 322 BCE, was a Greek philosopher, a logician, and a scientist. Along with his teacher, Plato, Aristotle is generally regarded as one of the most influential ancient thinkers in a number of philosophical fields, including political theory. Aristotle was born in northern Greece and his father was court physician to the king of Macedon. As a young man, he studied in Plato's academy in Athens, but after Plato's death, he left Athens to conduct philosophical and biological research in Asia Minor and Lesbos. And he was then invited by King Philip II of Macedon to tutor his young son, Alexander the Great, 
Soon after Alexander succeeded his father and consolidated the conquest of the Greek city-states, he launched the invasion of the Persian Empire. Aristotle, returning as a resident alien to Athens, wrote, or at least worked on, some of his major treatises, including the politics. When Alexander died suddenly, Aristotle had to flee from Athens because of his Macedonian connections, and he died soon thereafter. Aristotle's life seems to have influenced his political thought in various ways. Indeed, his interest in biology seems to be expressed in the naturalism of his politics. His interest in comparative politics and his sympathies for democracy as well as monarchy may have been encouraged by his travels and experience of diverse political systems. We understand that the modern word political derives from the Greek from the Greek politikos of or pertaining to the polis. The Greek term polis will be translated here as city-state, which is what we're examining. It is also translated as city or polis, or simply anglicized as polis. City-states like Athens and Sparta were relatively small and cohesive units in which political, religious, and cultural concerns were intertwined. The extent of their similarity to modern nation-states is really rather controversial. Aristotle's word for politics is politike, which is short for politi politike, episteme, or political science. It belongs to one of three main branches of science, which Aristotle distinguishes by their ends or objects. There is contemplative science, including physics and metaphysics, which is concerned with truth or knowledge for its own sake. Practical science with good action and productive science with making useful or beautiful objects. And so politics is a practical science since it is concerned with the noble action or happiness of the citizens, although it resembles a productive science in that it seeks to create, preserve, and reform political systems. Aristotle thus understands politics as a normative or prescriptive discipline rather than as simply a purely empirical or descriptive inquiry. Political science studies the tasks of the politician or the statesman in much the same way that medical science concerns the work of the physician. It is, in fact, the body of knowledge that such practitioners, if truly expert, will also wield in pursuing their task. The most important task for the politician is in the role of lawgiver to frame the appropriate constitution for the city-state. This involves enduring laws, customs, and institutions for the citizens. Once the constitution is in place, the politician needs to take the appropriate measures to maintain it, to introduce reforms when he finds them necessary, and to prevent developments which might subvert the political system. This is the province of legislative science, which Aristotle regards as more important than politics as exercised in everyday political activity. Aristotle frequently compares the politician to a craftsman. Well, the analogy is imprecise because politics in the strict sense of legislative science, is a form of practical knowledge, while a craft like architecture or medicine is a form of productive knowledge. However, the comparison is valid 
to the extent that the politician produces, operates, maintains a legal system according to universal principles. Well, in order to appreciate this analogy, it is helpful to observe that Aristotle explains the production of an artifact in terms of four causes. The material, formal, efficient, and final causes. For example, clay, which is the material cause, is molded into a vase shape, which is the formal clause or forming cause, by a potter, who is the efficient or the moving cause, so that it can contain liquid, which is its final cause. One can also explain the existence of city-states in terms of these four causes. It is a kind of community that is a collection of parts having some functions and interests in common. Hence, it is made up of parts, which Aristotle describes in various ways in different contexts, as households, or economic classes, or local political units. But ultimately, the city-state is composed of individual citizens who, along with natural resources, are the material or the equipment out of which the city-state is fashioned. So that is the material cause. The next, if we remember, is the formal cause. The formal cause of the city-state is in its constitution. Aristotle defines the constitution as a certain ordering of the inhabitants of the city-state. He also speaks of the constitution of a community as the form of the compound and argues that whether the community is the same over time depends on whether it has the same constitution. Now, the constitution in this sense is not a written document, but an eminent organizing principle, analogous rather to the soul of an organism. Hence, the constitution is also the way of life of the citizens. Here, citizens are that minority of the resident population, then, who possess full political rights. And so the different parts of the community, then, make up its material. What forms it is its constitution, again, not a written constitution, rather the soul of the community. And then the existence of the city-state also requires an efficient cause, namely its ruler. Okay, here we go. In Aristotle's view, a community of any sort can possess order only if it has a ruling element or authority. This ruling principle is defined by the Constitution, which sets criteria for political offices, particularly the sovereign office, the leader. However, if you imagine on a deeper level, there must be an efficient cause to explain why a city-state acquires its constitution in the first place, right? So Aristotle states that the person who first established the city-state is the cause of very great effect. This person was evidently the lawgiver in the beginning, someone like Stallone of Athens, who founded the Constitution. Aristotle compares, then, the lawgiver, or the politician more generally, to a craftsman like a weaver or a shipbuilder who fashions material into a finished product. So, the notion of final cause then dominates Aristotle's work Politics from, indeed, its opening lines. Quote, Since we see every city-state is a sort of community, and that every community is established for the sake of some good, for everyone does everything for the sake of what they believe to be good, right? It is clear that every community aims at some good 
and that the community which has the most authority of all and includes all the others aims highest, that is, at the good, with the most authority. This is what's called the city-state or the political community. So to sum up then Aristotle, right? The city-state is a matter form, compound. To sum up then, the city-state, i.e. this matter-form, compound of a particular population, in other words, the citizen body, in a given territory, and a constitution. The constitution itself is fashioned by the lawgiver and is governed by politicians who are like craftsmen in the efficient cause, and the constitution defines the aim of the city-state the final cause. Aristotle's analysis has important practical implications for him. Just as the craftsman should not try to impose a form on materials for which it is unsuited, i.e. to build a house out of sand, the, ledger, the, the legislator should not lay down or change laws which are contrary to the nature of the citizens. Oh, Okay, so I'm bearing in mind, again, North Korea and South Korea, and why North Korea would allow itself to be authoritarian and communistic, and South Korea to be democratic. Is it then in the nature of the citizens that are causing this constitution, through the lawgivers, to be the final cause? Yeah, I, th I think we're getting there. So... Aristotle, then, accordingly rejects utopian schemes, such as the proposal in Plato's Republic that children and property should belong to all citizens in common. <laughs> For this runs afoul of the fact that people give most attention to their own property, less to what is communal, or only as much as it falls to them to give attention. So you would mow your own front yard, but you might not go down to the dog park on the corner and mow that lawn, right? That people pay more attention to their own property first without really not a thought to the communal. Okay. Well, this runs afoul then of Plato's Republic's utopian schemes, suggesting rather that the, the formal cause is to allow the individual citizen to pay attention to their own personal property. Yeah, okay. So Aristotle is also wary of causal political innovation, okay, because it can have the deleterious side effect of undermining the citizen's habit of obeying the law. It is in these terms, then, that Aristotle understands the fundamental normative problem of politics. What constitutional form should the lawgiver establish and preserve in what material for the sake of what end? Next, we turn our attention to Niccolo Machiavelli, who lived from 1469 to 1527. We understand that Machiavelli is often cited as the first modern political scientist because of his emphasis on statecraft and empirical knowledge. He also analyzed different political systems, believing the findings could be applied by statesmen discussed in his book, The Prince. We know that the Italian Renaissance of the 14th and 15th centuries saw the rebirth of many of the ideals of classical Greece and Rome, including the ideal of self-government. Among those who celebrated the rebirth of republican government was none other than our, our beloved Niccolo Machiavelli, who lived from 1469 to 1527. Well, we understand that Machiavelli is best known as the author of The Prince, 
a short book in which he apparently advocates rule by a single person who should not hesitate to use cruelty or deceit to stay in power. In his longer book, The Discourses, however, he takes a very different position. I'm going to read to you just a little bit from his work, The Discourses, in which Machiavelli criticizes the claim that people acting collectively are less wise than a single king or a prince. He says then, I say that individual men, and especially princes, may be charged with the same defects of which writers accuse the people. For whoever is not controlled by laws will commit the same errors as an unbridled multitude. This may easily be verified, for there have been and still are plenty of princes, and a few good and wise ones, such I mean as needed not the curb that controlled them. Amongst these, however, are not to be counted either the kings that lived in Egypt at the ancient period when that country was governed by laws, or those that arose in Sparta. Neither such are born in our day in France, for that country is more thoroughly regulated by laws than any other of which have any knowledge in modern times. I say that both governments of princes and of people have lasted a long time, but both required to be regulated by laws. For a prince who knows no other control but his own will is like a madman, and a people who can do as it pleases will hardly be wise. If now we compare a prince who is controlled by laws and a people that is restricted by them, we shall find more virtue in the people than in the prince. And if we compare them when both are freed from such control, we shall see that the people are guilty of fewer excesses than the prince, and that the errors of the people are of less importance, and therefore more easily remedied. For a licentious and mutinous people can easily be brought back to good conduct by the influence and persuasion of a good leader. But an evil-minded prince is not amenable to such influences, and therefore there is no other remedy against him but cold steel. We may judge, then, from this, of the relative defects of the one and the other. If words suffice to correct those of the people, while those of the prince can only be remedied by violence, no one can fail to see that where the greater remedy is required, there also the defects must be greater. The follies which a people commits at the moment of its greatest license are not what is most to be feared. It is not the immediate evil that may result from them that inspires apprehension, but the fact that such general confusion might afford the opportunity for a tyrant to seize government. But with evil-disposed princes, the contrary is the case. It is the immediate present that causes fear, and there is hope only in the future. For men will persuade themselves that the termination of his wicked life may give them a chance of liberty. Thus we see the difference between the one and the other to be, that the one touches the present and the other the future. The excesses of the people are directed against those whom they suspect of interfering with the public good, while those of the princes are against apprehended interference with their individual interests. The general prejudice against the people results from the fact that everybody can freely and fearlessly speak ill of them in mass, even whilst they are at the height of their power. But a prince can only be spoken of with the greatest circumspection and apprehension. 
So if we're looking at the constitutions, then, argues Machiavelli with an eye to Aristotle, what is the best form of government? A monarchy or a democracy? And why? Our next key thinker is Thomas Hobbes, who lived from 1588 to 1679. Thomas Hobbes developed the notion of the social contract, whereby people surrender liberties in favor of order, and he advocated a powerful state in his work, Leviathan. Hobbes has suffered a fate shared by many classic authors. His greatest work is more often quoted than carefully and thoroughly read. <laughs> well, there are reasons for this. Hobbes took pains to be quotable, sometimes at the cost, really, of obscuring his method. And Leviathan is a very long book, not all of whose parts are obviously relevant to its central purpose. Our aim here in today's class is to give you some sense of how the parts fit together and how to ward off misunderstanding, which makes criticism and thereby rejection seem easy. Well, a brief summary of Hobbes' argument will suggest both why we still read him and why few accept what they read. Hobbes contends that by nature people are sufficiently unsocial that if they had to live without an effective government to check them, they would find themselves in a war of all against all. But people are also sufficiently dependent on one another that in such a war, everyone's life would be, in the book's most famous phrase, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. This alternative is so horrible that life under any effective government would be preferable to it, no matter what the form of that government. The same features of human nature, which would make life in the state of nature so miserable, also make it impossible for any government to be effective if it does not possess absolute power. To try to limit the powers of government by a constitution or by dividing authority among different branches of government is, in Thomas Hobbes' mind, to invite anarchy and misery within the state of nature. So the subject of an absolute government should prefer that form of government to any other and give it their simple obedience. So coming back to our idea of comparative political systems in order to understand how those different systems operate within the global aspect of international relations, if you are a citizen of an effective dictatorship, which makes your life secure from both internal and external threats, without allowing you any say in how you are governed, presumably you are morally required to obey that government and give it your support. If this is Hobbes' conclusion, most of us, I suppose, would find it unacceptable. But Hobbes' argument can feel very forceful. So let's analyze its structure, perhaps, in a little finer detail. Well, we have to understand that Leviathan really is a scientific treatise, right? In the terms of political science, then, Leviathan begins with topics apparently far removed from the subject of political obedience. The nature of thought, of language, and science. Well, why start this well? Why start this way? Well, like Descartes, Hobbes thinks of himself as providing new foundations for philosophy, in his case, as making civil philosophy, the knowledge of the rules of life and society, scientific for the first time. To claim this, then, he must give some account of science, right? So he takes his model geometry, the only science, quote, that has pleased God hereto hitherto to bestow on mankind. No. He takes as his model geometry. One thing 
which makes geometry scientific, is that geometricians first settle on the meanings of the terms they use. Once they have all done this correctly, all they have to do is all they have to do further is to calculate the consequences of those definitions. This conception of science makes a lot rest on the definitions. <laughs> Granted that they are supposed to be the starting points of demonstrations, it still seems fair to ask why we should accept these definitions, particularly if they seem controversial. For example, midway through Leviathan, Hobbes will claim that his definitions of the words essential to political reasoning are universally agreed upon. Well, unfortunately, this is false advertising. It's not true, and it seems Hobbes must have known that it wasn't true. Earlier, he had written that a man who aspires to true knowledge must examine the definitions of former authors and either correct them where they are negligently set down or make them himself. So frequently he offers his own definitions as explicit corrections on those commonly given. Examples include his definition of the will or his definition of justice. When he defines the terms right of nature and the law of nature, which we'll find reflected in the Declaration of Independence, he complains that writers on this subject tend to confuse two notions. Similarly, when he discusses the true liberty of the subject and the distinction between counsels and commands, he complains that previous writers have barely understood these concepts. These definitions certainly involve terms essential to our political reasoning. So, in civil philosophy, an effective system must achieve the ends for which we form a civil society, right? If we're agreeing with Aristotle and subsequently Machiavelli, then this is held to be true. It is from experience that we learn what ends we form civil society for. That's one reason why Hobbes acknowledges that his argument depends partly on experience. So then Hobbes asks, can we escape the state of nature being without government? One thing in any case is clear. If we are in a state of nature, and if we are rational, we must try to escape it. Is this possible? We are supposed to enter into a contract with others to form a state, this so-called social contract. We see that Hobbes' theory allows that people in the state of nature might, in spite of the war of all against all, cooperate on some things. But is forming the state one of them? What is it for there to be a state anyway? For Hobbes, the existence of the state requires the existence of a sovereign, a person, authorized by the community to act on their behalf for their peace and their safety, so that what the person does counts as an act of the community as a whole. This person need not be an individual human being, a king, a queen, or an emperor. It might be an assembly of people i.e. the Congress, or a Parliament, or an Assembly that could, in principle, be the whole population, though that would involve practical difficulties in a community of any size. What is essential is that there be some agreed procedure by which the community can act as a collective entity. It will simplify discussion if we think, then, of the sovereign as an individual. The real problem about creating a sovereign comes not with his selection, but with his empowerment. If the sovereign is a single individual, or even an assembly made up of relatively few citizens, he will not have sufficient natural power to enforce all or even many of his commands. 
This follows from the approximate equality of power in the state of nature. So the sovereign's power depends on the voluntary obedience of at least a significant minority of his subjects, right? A lasting relation of dominion cannot be based on natural power alone. It is not essential for the sovereign to have effective power that all or even a majority of his subjects obey his commands willingly, so long as a powerful minority will obey commands to punish those who disobey his commands. The sovereign needs an enforcement cadre, right? A police force or an army, which must be larger and more dedicated just in proportion as people in general are more hostile to the regime. For the sovereign to have power to protect us and consequently the right to our obedience, what is crucial is not an oath which we or our ancestors took at some point in time, but whether the enforcement cadre is willing to see that the laws are obeyed and whether people in general are willing at least not to forcibly resist the enforcement. So those readers who look more deeply into Leviathan will notice that the sovereign then must be imbued with divine right authority. In other words, that the will of God is behind the will of the sovereign, giving that sovereign divine authority to act. Well, those interpreters of Leviathan who think a divine command to obey political authority is central to Hobbes' argument are missing what is perhaps the most fundamental feature of his work. He is writing for a world in which religious divisions introduced by the Reformation have made any serious attempt to base politics on religion futile. We are too deeply divided on our religious beliefs and too insecure in our grounding for their beliefs for any such strategy to prove a generally acceptable rationale for political obedience. In Hobbes' day, there were a great many people who had not grasped the consequence of the Reformation. Their children, though fewer proportionately in any modern Western society, are still with us and still need to learn the negative lessons of Leviathan. We may seem deeply divided in our values, as we are in our religious beliefs, but we need civil society if we are to survive and to have even a tolerably comfortable existence. Hobbes would have agreed with the spirit of Rodney King's remarks in the Los Angeles riots. We are all stuck here together for a while. Can't we all just get along? We need to try to find some way to get along. Hobbes then was convinced that civil society, as he understood it, was our best hope of doing just that. So again, looking at the major thinkers in comparative politics, we've touched on Aristotle, we've touched on Machiavelli, and we've touched on Hobbes. Our next philosopher is John Locke, who lived from 1632 to 1704. He was an English philosopher and a politician. He was born in Somerset, where Locke studied medicine at Oxford, before becoming secretary to Anthony Ashley Cooper, the first Earl of Shaftesbury. His political views were developed against the background of, and were shaped by, the English Revolution, much as was Hobbes. A consistent opponent of absolutism, and often portrayed as the philosopher of the Glorious Revolution of 1688, which established a constitutional monarchy, Locke is usually seen as a key thinker of early liberalism. Although he accepted that by nature humans are free and equal, the priority he accorded property rights prevented him from endorsing political equality or democracy in the modern sense. So Locke's most important political works are A Letter Concerning Toleration of 1689 and Two Treatises of Civil Government from 1690. So again, liberals do not believe that a balanced and tolerant society will develop naturally out of the free actions of individuals or voluntary associations. 
This is where liberals disagree with anarchists, who believe that both law and government are unnecessary. Liberals fear that free individuals may wish to exploit others, to steal their property, or turn them into slaves if it is their interest to do so. That was the argument that Hobbes was making, this war of every man against every man. They may also break or ignore their contracts when it is to their advantage. The liberty of one person is always therefore in danger of becoming a license to abuse another. Each person can be said to be both a threat to and under threat from every other member of society, says Hobbes. Our liberty requires that they are restrained from encroaching on our freedom, and in turn their liberty requires that they are safeguarded from us. Liberals have traditionally believed that such protection can only be provided by a sovereign state, capable of restraining all individuals and groups within a society. Freedom can therefore only exist under law, as John Locke puts it, where there is no law, there is no freedom. This argument is the basis of social contract theory, as I suggest, developed by 17th century writers Thomas Hobbes. Locke, which, for example, explains the individual's political obligations toward the state. Both Hobbes and Locke constructed a picture of what life had been like before government was formed in a stateless society and what they called a state of nature. As individuals are selfish, greedy, power-seeking, the state of nature would be characterized by an unending civil war of each against all. As a result, they argued rational individuals would enter into an agreement, or this social contract, to establish a sovereign government, without which orderly and stable life would be impossible. All individuals would recognize that it is in their interest to sacrifice a portion of their liberty in order to set up a system of law. Otherwise, their rights, well, and indeed their lives, would constantly be under threat. Both Hobbes and Locke were aware that this contract, well, really is an historical fiction. The purpose of the social contract argument, however, is to highlight the value of the sovereign state to the individual. In other words, Hobbes and Locke wished individuals to behave as if the historical fiction were true. By respecting and obeying government and law in gratitude for their safety and security that only a sovereign state could provide. The social contract argument embodies several important liberal attitudes toward the state in particular and political authority in general. In the first place, it suggests that in a sense, political authority comes from below. The state is created by individuals and for individuals. It exists in order to serve their needs and interests. Governments arise out of the agreement or consent of the governed. This implies that citizens do not have an absolute obligation to obey all laws and accept any form of government. If government is based upon a contract made by the governed, government itself may break the terms of the contract. When the legitimacy of government evaporates, the people have the right of rebellion. This principle was developed by Locke in his two treatises of government, and was used to justify the glorious revolution of 1688, which deposed King James II of England and established a constitutional monarchy in Britain under King William and Queen Mary. It was also clearly expressed, as we know, by Thomas Jefferson in the American Declaration of Independence, which declares that when governments become an absolute despotism, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. Secondly, Social contract theory portrays the state as an umpire or a neutral referee in society. The state is not created by a privileged elite wishing to exploit the masses, but out of an agreement amongst the whole people. The state, therefore, embodies the interests, ostensibly, of all citizens and acts as a neutral arbiter when individuals or groups come within conflict with one another. For example, 
If individuals break contracts made with others, the state applies the rules of the game and enforces the terms of the contract, provided, of course, each party had entered into the contract voluntarily and in full knowledge. The essential characteristic of any such umpire is that its actions are and are seen to be impartial. So John Locke, then, is regarding the state as a neutral arbiter among the competing individuals and groups within society through a constitutional government rising from the social contract. And so, again, John Locke argues that private property and the ability to make contracts is essential to individual freedom and prosperity. And again, he advocated this in two treatises of government. The next key thinker under our examination is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who lived from 1712 to 1778. Rousseau argued that citizens' rights are inalienable and, not can, and cannot be taken away by the state. His work influenced the development of civil rights, and these ideas are discussed in his work, literally titled The Social Contract. In The Social Contract, the first principle from which Rousseau proceeds is his opening declaration, famous and well-known to many. Man is born free. In other words, man's essential nature is that of a being with a capacity for free development. This principle, which was taken from Aristotle, was emphatically not an empirical generalization, but a statement which, as he implied, could not be disproved by any particular for experience. For if a free man, as Rousseau stated, is everywhere in chains, the empirical evidence would seem to deny the truth of that assertion. In beginning with this seeming paradox, he effectively dismissed the relevance of such empirical and contingent evidence, which certainly would not be found in absolutist societies of our day. His first principle is a statement not of empirical facts, but of value or of metaphysical truth. It is regarded as true by definition, as a normative statement of essential potentiality, akin to what Kant would soon call a regulative idea, a concept which we use as a yardstick to evaluate existent social institutions. What he clearly set out here to establish, then, is not a description of actually prevailing social conditions, Rather, a set of principles by which reason can determine what is right, what is wrong, what ought to be. His instrument was the concept of a social contract, not taken as an historical event, but as a body of operating principles, which is logically presumed in the actual functioning of the social order. It includes the political procedures of a society, but also the accepted ways in which its citizens regulate their family lives, education, business affairs, even their recreation. The social contract is then a convenient name for a way in which the general will of society, concerning the ways in which it functions, is implicitly and explicitly manifested. It is that body of implicit, implicit and explicit agreements which bind a society into a cohesive whole. Its opposite is the notion of a state of nature, again, pictured not as an historical situation, but as a useful fiction by which one may understand that a complete lack of social agreements would entail. The social contract as Rousseau uses it, describes the body of operating rights and obligations 
in terms of which a society defines its own nature and the restraints and freedoms which its members enjoy because of it. Well, a traffic light on the corner, right? Something as simple as that serves really as a sim useful symbolic illustration of the way in which these concepts elucidate Rousseau's concept of society. It expresses the general will that traffic should be regulated so that drivers and pedestrians can both use the streets with reasonable safety. As each driver stops for the red light and each pedestrian waits for it, there is implicitly recognized the whole series of social agreements, this whole social contract, which makes that inherently impotent and arbitrary light a means of regulating the use of the street. Should a recalcitrant driver or a pedestrian ignore the light, he would be apprehended with general approval, right? The law applies to all, you can't run a red light. Should drivers or pedestrians then ignore the light, the regulations governing it would become unenforceable. Chaos, a miniature state of nature, ensues, and the use of the street by anyone becomes impossible or hazardous. In every use of the street, according to the laws and regulations governing its use, each driver and pedestrian is assenting to the general will, right? Acknowledging that the social contract which sets out the procedure for translating that general will into specific laws and customs, giving his tacit consent to these laws, limiting his liberty to drive or walk as he chooses, and taking for granted the consequent positive freedom to use that street as a means of driving or walking in comparative safety to his chosen destination. Well, if we conceive society then, right, and the social contract in this sense, then Rousseau's argument, insofar as our study of comparative governments, comparative political systems, and of international relations writ large, really becomes fairly straightforward. A contract is essentially a voluntary agreement which specifies certain reciprocal rights and obligations, right? Its purpose is to assure the contracting parties of specific opportunities or freedoms to undertake specific kinds of acts and to spell out the obligations that are to be recognized as their price. It presumes the parties have freely entered into the agreement for their mutual advantage. Just as an argument is logically absurd... If its conclusion contradicts its premises, so the social contract is legitimate if it denies its essential premise of human freedom, right? This is to say that a society predicated on repressive relationship of master and slave, as we're going to see in a moment with Marx and Engels, rather than a society of free men, has contradicted the principle of contract and is therefore illegitimate. It must be governed by force, but not by right, and its government cannot legitimately demand the loyalty of its citizens. Free men are not merely subjects, they are citizens, members of their society and constituents of it. They can only be legitimately bound by their own acts of will and a legitimate social order rests on the tacit consent of its citizens that it function as it does. That is to say that however originated, a legitimate society at any point of development is the expression of the general will or consensus of its members that it conduct its affairs according to the procedures for decisions which it uses. A legitimate society acknowledges that its prime function is the enhancement of the freedom of its citizens to the fullest extent possible within the limits of the situation and the requirements which they choose to recognize. Our next philosopher, then, Karl Marx, who lived from 1818 to 1883, we've touched on in several lectures heretofore and will touch on in several lectures coming up specifically around structuralism. And so to go into Marx again would be redundant. I would just encourage you to go back to our chapter 3 and chapter 4 to get at Karl Marx. 
which leaves us freedom then to move on to Max Weber. So our next and final key thinker in comparative politics and thus in international relations would be Max Weber, who lived from 1864 to 1920. Weber wrote widely on such topics as bureaucracy, forms of authority, and the impact of culture on economic and political development. And he developed many of these themes in his work titled Economy and Society. In Economy and Society, Weber starts in volume one by carefully laying out some of his basic terms, such as sociology, which he claimed was a science concerning itself with the interpretive understanding of social action and thereby with a causal explanation of its course and consequences, as well as defining meaning, not as something objectively correct or even metaphysically true, but as either the actual existing meaning in the given concrete case of a particular actor, or to the average or approximate meaning attributable to a given plurality of actors. Weber describes his approach as a comparative methodology which compares the pure type of rational actions and deviations from it. Okay, Social action he defines as action oriented to others' behavior. It can be oriented in four ways. He's going to suggest instrumentum, instrumentally rational, value rational, effectual, and traditional. Again, instrumentally rational, value rational, effectual, and traditional. We'll be coming back to these again and again, so understanding Weber and getting him under our belt first is very important to our study. Weber discusses types of legitimate order divided into two types, convention and law. The legitimacy of a social order may be guaranteed, he said, in two ways. One is purely subjective, effectual, value rational, or religious. The other is by the expectation of specific external effects, that is, by interest situations, including convention and law. Convention denotes an order whose validity is externally guaranteed by the probability that deviation from it within a social group will result in a relatively general and practically significant reaction disapproval, while law denotes an order that is externally guaranteed by the probability that physical or psychological coercion will be applied by a staff of people in order to bring about compliance or avenge its violation. This distinction is going to become important here in a minute. Social relationships, says Weber, can be characterized as conflict, which is carrying out one's will against the resistance of others, and competition, a formally peaceful attempt to gain control over opportunities or advantages that others also want, or selection, an often latent struggle for advantage or, or survival, but without any kind of mutual orientation. So again, social relationships can be characterized as conflict, competition, or selection. Social relationships can also be characterized as communal when individuals' social orientation is based on the feeling that they belong together or associative 
when the social alliance is based on a rationally motivated adjustment of interests or a similarly motivated argument. So social relationships can be characterized as communal or associative. For instance, market relationships are associative. So are the relationships based on shared belief in certain absolute values. But religious brotherhoods, erotic relationships, personal loyalty, and esprit de corps are associative. Of course, there are several ideals, as Weber points out, even merchants often like their customers. <laughs> Social relationships, then, can be characterized as open to outsiders or closed to outsiders. So, again, open to outsiders if its system of order does not deny participation to anyone who wishes to join and is actually in a position to do so, or closed to them if participation of certain persons is excluded, limited, or subjected to conditions. Again, this is going to become important as we continue to study the systems of government and the manifestation of the social contract through the state. So, taking this to its next step, Weber suggests that an organization is then a social relationship which is either closed or limits the admission of outsiders and its regulations are enforced by specific individuals, a chief and possibly an administrative staff which normally also have representative powers. Organizations, Weber suggests, are autonomous, i.e. governed by an order the members themselves established, or heteronominous, governed by an order imposed from the outside. Weber draws several other distinctions to characterize organizations, but we'll skip, we'll skip a bit further. Weber now defines power, the probability that one actor within a social relationship will be in a position to carry out his own will despite resistance, regardless of the basis on which the probability exists, and domination, the probability that a command with a given specific content will be obeyed by a given group of persons. So, again, Weber defines power and domination, but he distinguishes between political organizations who are tasked with safeguarding an order in a territory via physical force and the state, which enjoys a monopoly of the legitimate use of political force, and hierarchic organizations which safeguard order via psychic coercion, including one might example, the church, right? Which enjoys a monopoly on hierocratic coercion. With this groundwork out of the way, then in economy and society, Weber goes on to discuss the division of labor, providing a discussion that is encyclopedic, although not as broadly applied or necessary to go into in our studies. Weber names three types of legitimate domination, right? We're talking about power and domination. And these three types show up frequently in the rest of the two volumes of his work, Economy and Society. And this discussion really reminded me of Machiavelli in its careful delineation and description of types Though Machiavelli was talking about governments and Weber is talking about broader issues of legitimacy, right? And so claims of legitimacy can be based on rational grounds, legal authority. This is a type that underpins bureaucracies or traditional grounds that rests on traditional authority or charismatic grounds that rests on charismatic authority. So again, Rational grounds, traditional grounds, and charismatic grounds. Okay, so legal authority, based on rational grounds, organizes its offices via hierarchy. 
It especially uses that most unambiguous structure of domination, the bureaucracy. Bureaucrats are appointed, not elected. The bureaucracy, then, is, from a purely technical point of view, capable of attaining the highest degree of efficiency and is, in this sense, formally the most rational known means of exercising authority, power, over human beings in the social contract. Yes, it is superior to any other form in its precision, in its stability, in the stringency of its discipline, and in its reliability. It thus makes possible a particularly high degree of calculability of results for the heads of the organizations and from those acting in relation to it. It is finally superior both in its intensive efficiency and in the scope of its operations, and is formally capable of application to all kinds of administrative tasks. Bureaucracy, Weber adds, is supported by extremely important conditions in the fields of communication and transportation. The precision of its functioning requires the services of the railway, right? The telegraph and the telephone becomes increasingly dependent on them. That is, communication and transportation technologies create the conditions under which bureaucracies can flourish. After all, bureaucratic administration means fundamentally domination through knowledge, including both technical knowledge and knowledge growing out of experience in the service. The next then we have are the traditional grounds. Authority will be called traditional if legitimacy is claimed for it and believed in it by virtue of the sanctity of age-old rules and powers. Rules are obeyed due to their traditional status. In this simplest case, it can be based in personal loyalty from a common upbringing. Obedience is owed to a person, not the rules. Commands are legitimized in terms of action, which is bound to specific traditions, and action which is free of specific rules, falling within a sphere of discretion. Pure traditional authority lacks things that we associate with bureaucracy, a rationally established hierarchy, a regular system of appointment on the basis of free contract, technical training, or, or fixed salaries, right? So traditional crowns, because we've always done it this way. So rational grounds by legal authority, by a constitution, traditional grounds, because we've always done it this way, this is the way it's done, and finally, legitimacy on charismatic grounds. The term charisma will be applied to a certain quality of individual personality by virtue of which he is considered extraordinary and treated with supernatural, superhuman, or at least specifically exceptional powers or qualities. Charismatic authority, of course, cannot remain stable because it is based on a person and not on law and not on tradition. In being made routine, it can easily turn into a clan state or a cult of personality in which a political body is organized strictly and completely in terms of this principal charismatic individual. And so again, Max Weber, in his work Economy and Society, draws out the three types of legitimate domination through rational grounds, legal, traditional grounds, we've always done it this way, or charismatic grounds by virtue of a charismatic personality. And so in looking at the main thinkers in comparative politics and how this may relate to international relations, it's very clear. Aristotle, Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and Weber all talk about the state of nature, the social contract, 
legitimacy, and authority. And so looking at our methodology, how we hope to compare and contrast our four case studies with a view to the perspectives and perhaps levels of analysis as already developed in this course with now a clearer understanding of the philosophical tradition from Aristotle through Weber, we look at our research methods, our methodology. One area of conflict always in methodology is how best to gather and analyze data. What is it that we are looking at? How do we look at it? We have already spoken in this class about the problems of comparative methodology involving selecting cases and perhaps controlling variables. Within these concerns are further questions of how one gathers and interprets the data to compare these cases and measure these variables. Some comparative political scientists rely on qualitative methods, evidence and methodology such as interviews, observations, archival, and other forms of documentary research. Qualitative approaches are often narrowly focused, deep investigations of one or a few cases drawing from scholarly expertise. However, some qualitative studies, such as work on modernization or revolution, do involve numerous cases spread out across the globe and spanning centuries. Either way, qualitative approaches are typically inductive, beginning with case studies to generate theory, ah, which is what we're here to do today. For some political scientists, a qualitative approach is of dubious value. Variables are not rigorously defined or measured. They are, they, variables are not rigorously defined or measured, they argue, and hypotheses are not tested by using a large sample of cases. Asserting that qualitative work fails to contribute to the accumulation of knowledge and is little better than the approach that dominated the field a century ago, these critics advocate quantitative methods instead. Okay, they favor a wider use of cases unbound by area specialization, greater use of statistical analysis, and mathematical models often drawn from economics. These qualitative, these quantitative methodologists are more likely to use deductive reasoning, starting with a theory that political scientists can test with an array of data. Many advocates of qualitative research question whether quantitative approaches measure and test variables that are of any particular value or simply focus on often mundane things that can be expressed numerically. Over-dependence on quantitative measures can lead scholars to avoid the important questions that cannot be addressed by using strict scientific methods. Well, then in theory, a second related debate concerns theoretical assumptions about human behavior, right? Which is why we went into such great detail in looking at our philosophers. Are human beings rational? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, sorry, in, <laughs> are human beings rational? In this sense, that their behavior conforms to some generally understandable behavior. Some say yes. These scholars use what is known as rational choice to study the rules by which politics is played and how human beings act on their preferences. For instance, how and why people decide to vote or choose a political party. Such models can, ideally, lead not only to explanation, ah, but also to prediction, a basic element of science. As you might have guessed, rational choice theory is closely associated with quantitative methods. And like the critics of quantitative methods in general, 
those who reject rational choice theory assert that the emphasis on individual rationality discounts the importance of things like historical complexity, unintended outcomes, or even cultural factors. In fact, some consider rational choice theories, as they do behaviorism, behavioralism, to be a Western, or really specifically American, assumption about self-interest, markets, and individual autonomy that do not e really easily describe the world. As these debates have persisted, the world around us continues to change, just as the wrenching political changes in the Middle East are not anticipated, neither was the end of the Cold War 20 years ago. Few scholars, regardless of methodology or theoretical focus, anticipated or even considered either dramatic set of events. Similarly, religion has re-emerged as an important component in politics around the globe, a force that modernization theory told us was on the wane. New economic powers have emerged in Asia, coinciding with democracy in some, but not in others. Terrorism, once the tactic of secular revolutionary groups in the 1970s, has also resurfaced, albeit in the hands now of different actors. It seems that many political scientists, whatever their persuasion, have had little to contribute to many of these issues. Time and again, scholars are caught off guard. Well, where does that leave us now, right? As we try to do a comparative analysis of these case studies using the different perspectives in international relations to get a bead on what we might predict for the future, where does this lack of quantitative versus qualitative agreement leave us? In recent years, some signs of conciliation have emerged. Scholars recognize that careful scholarship and theorizing are possible with both qualitative and quantitative methods. Inductive and deductive reasoning can both generate valuable theories in international relations. Rational choice and historical or cultural approaches can contribute to and be integrated into each other. One finds more mixed method approaches that use both quantitative and qualitative research. As a result, some scholars have spoken optimistically of an integration of mathematics or narrative case studies and a rational choice model, each contributing to the other. For example, large-scale quantitative studies of political activity can be further elucidated by turning to individual cases that investigate the questions in greater detail. At the same time, it's really worth noting that the difficulties in making comparative politics international relations and political science itself more rigorous and scientific are not unique. Across the social and life sciences, there is what has been termed a replication crisis, where numerous influential studies cannot be replicated. <laughs> Much to the relief of parents, this includes the famous marshmallow test, which concluded that a child's ability to delay gratification, for example, waiting to eat a marshmallow, could predict future achievement in school and in work. A final observation is in order as we bring this part of our topic today to a close. Irrespective of methodology or theory, many have observed that political science as a whole is out of touch with real-world concerns and is effectively inaccessible to laypersons, and has failed to speak to those who make decisions about policy, whether voters, like you and I, or elected leaders. Commentators and scholars often assert that political science has created a culture that glorifies 
arcane unintelligibility <laughs> while disdaining impact and audience. Well, this is misleading, given the growing emphasis on reconnecting political science to central policy questions. So, international relations should not simply be about what we can study or what we want to study, but also about how our research can reach people, empower them, and help them be better citizens and leaders. A call for greater relevance may represent a change for some scholars, but relevance and rigor are not at odds, my friends. They are, in fact, central to a meaningful political science and international relations study. Our next quick step is to discuss two steps of political organization, consensus and coercion. So we've been nibbling around the edges of this. What is the difference between then democratic rule and authoritarian rule? How is that called forth by the social contract or through the social contract? Well, in a consensus model as a path of organization, individuals band together to protect themselves and create common rules, right? Leadership is chosen from among the people and we understand that there is security through cooperation. And so this then gives way to democratic rule. It is the inherent foundation of democratic rule. But it isn't to say that is the only way or the right way. Another path to political organization has to do with coercion as opposed to consensus. In coercion, individuals are brought together by a ruler who imposes authority and monopolizes power. Security is then achieved not through cooperation, but through domination. And this manifests through an authoritarian rule. Which brings us to our final preliminary discussion before diving into our four case studies, having to do with legitimacy. Politics refers to the distribution and exercise of power within a society and polity, P-O-L-I-T-Y, refers to the political institution through which power is distributed and exercised in any society. In any society, decisions must be made regarding the allocation of resources and other matters. Except perhaps in the simplest societies, specific people and often, and often specific organizations make these decisions. Depending on the society, they sometimes make these decisions solely to benefit themselves and other times make these decisions to benefit the society as a whole. Well, regardless of who benefits, a central point is this. Some individuals and groups have more power than others. Because power is so essential to an understanding of politics, we need to have a discussion of politics within a discussion of power and that is equated to legitimacy. Power refers, again, one more time, to the ability to have one's will carried out despite the resistance of others. Most of us have seen a striking example of raw power when we're driving a car and we see a police car in our rearview mirror, right? At that particular moment, the driver of that car has enormous power over us. We make sure we strictly obey the speed limit, right? That your seatbelt is on, etc. And all other driving rules are being met. If, alas, the police car's lights are flashing, we stop the car. As otherwise, we may be in for even bigger trouble. When the officer approaches our car, we ordinarily try to be as polite as possible and pray, do we, and pray we do not get a ticket, right? When you're 16, and your parents told you to be home by midnight or else, your arrival home by this curfew again illustrated the use of power, in this case, parental power. If a child in a middle school gives her lunch to a bully who threatens her, that again is an example of the use of power and, well, indeed, the misuse of power. Well, these are all vivid examples of power, but the power that social scientists study is both grander and often more invisible. Much of it occurs behind the scenes 
and scholars continue to debate who is wielding it and for whose benefit they wield it. Max Weber, one of the founders of sociology, distinguished legitimate authority as a special type of power. Legitimate authority, sometimes just called authority, Weber said, is power whose use is considered just and appropriate by those over whom the power is exercised. In short, if a society approves the exercise of power in any particular way, then that power is also legitimate authority. The example of the police car in our rear view mirrors is an example of legitimate authority. Well, Weber's keen insight lay in distinguishing different types of legitimate authority that characterize different types of societies, especially as they evolve from simple to more complex systems. He called these three types traditional authority, rational legal authority, and charismatic authority. We know these, right? We just talked about these. Well, let's delve into them a little more fully. As the name implies, traditional authority is power that is rooted in traditional or long-standing beliefs and practices of a society. Yeah, it exists and is assigned to particular individuals because of that society's customs and traditions. Individuals enjoy traditional authority for at least one of two reasons. The first is inheritance, as certain individuals are granted traditional authority because they are the children or other relatives of people who already exercise traditional authority. The second reason individuals enjoy a traditional authority is more religious. Their societies believe that they are anointed by God or the gods, depending on the society's religious beliefs, to lead their society, which is why I mentioned divine right authority. Traditional authority is common in many pre-industrial societies where tradition and custom are so important, but also in modern monarchies where a king, a queen, or a prince enjoys power because she or he comes from a royal family. Traditional authority is granted to individuals regardless of their qualifications. They do not have to possess any special skills to receive and wield their authority, right? As their claim is solely based on their bloodline or the supposed divine designation. An individual granted traditional authority can be intelligent or not so intelligent, can be fair or arbitrary and exciting or boring, but receives the authority just the same because of custom and tradition. As not all individuals granted traditional authority are particularly well qualified to use it, societies governed by traditional authority sometimes find that individuals bestowed it are not always up to the job. The other example, rational legal authority, derives from custom and tradition. If traditional authority derives from custom and tradition, rational legal authority derives from law. Right? and is based on a belief in the legitimacy of a society's laws and rules and in the right of the leaders to act under those rules to make their decisions and set policy. This form of authority is a hallmark, then, of modern democracies, cooperative model, where power is given to people elected by voters and the rules for wielding that power are usually set forth in a constitution, a charter, or other written document. Whereas traditional authority resides in an individual because of the inheritance or divine designation, rational legal authority resides in the office that an individual fills, not in the individual per se. So the authority of the President of the United States resides in the office of the presidency, not in the individual who happens to be president. When the individual leaves office, authority transfers then to the next president. This transfer is, well, usually smooth and stable, and one of the models, marvels of democracy is that office holders are replaced in elections without revolutions. Rational legal authority helps ensure an orderly transfer of power in the time of crisis. When John F. Kennedy was assassinated, for example, in 1963, 
Vice President Lyndon Johnson was immediately sworn in as next president. When Richard Nixon resigned in disgrace in 1974 because of his involvement in the Watergate scandal, Vice President Gerald Ford became president. Because the U.S. Constitution provided for the transfer of power when the presidency was vacant, and because U.S. leaders and members of the public accept the authority of the Constitution on these and so many other matters, the transfer of power then in 1963 and 1974 was absolutely smooth and orderly. The final charismatic authority, again, Weber already touched on these, we're just going into greater detail, stems from an individual's extraordinary personal qualities and from that individual's hold over followers because of those qualities. So such charismatic in individuals may exercise authority over a whole society or only over a specific group within a larger society. They can exercise authority for good or for ill, as this brief list of charismatic leaders indicates. What about Joan of Arc or Adolf Hitler or Mahatma Gandhi? or Martin Luther King. Each of these individuals had extraordinary personal qualities that led their followers to admire them and to follow their orders or requests for action. So charismatic authority can reside in a person who became who came to a position of leadership because of traditional or rational legal authority. Over the centuries, for example, several kings and queens of England and other European nations were charismatic individuals as well. A few U.S. presidents, Washington, Lincoln, both Roosevelt's, Kennedy, Reagan, Donald Trump, were also charismatic, and much of their popularity stemmed from various personal qualities that attracted the public and the press. Well, Weber emphasized that charismatic authority in its purest form, in other words, when authority resides in someone solely because of the person's charisma, and not because the person has traditional or rational legal authority, is less stable right, than traditional authority or rational legal authority. The reason for this is simple. Once charismatic leaders die, well, their authority dies as well. Although a charismatic leader's example may continue to inspire people long after they die, it is difficult for another leader to come along and command people's devotion as intensely. After the deaths of all the charismatic leaders named a moment ago, none came close to replacing them in their hearts and minds of their followers. Because charismatic leaders recognize that their eventual death may well undermine the nation or cause they represent, they often designate a replacement leader who they hope will have the same charismatic qualities. This new leader may be a grown child of the charismatic leader or someone else the leader knows and trusts. Kim Jong-un is a good example of this. The danger, of course, is that any new leaders will lack sufficient charisma to have their authority accepted by the followers of the original charismatic leader. For this reason, Weber recognized that charismatic authority ultimately becomes more stable when it evolves into traditional or rational legal authority. Transformation into traditional authority can happen when charismatic leaders' authority becomes accepted as residing in their bloodlines so that their authority passes to their children and then to their grandchildren. Transformation into rational legal authority occurs when a society ruled by a charismatic leader develops the rules and bureaucratic structures that we associate with the government. And so Weber used the term routinization of charisma to refer to this transformation of charismatic authority in either of these ways.